the process and planning and conversations surrounding the decision to postpone oh, clearing of the encampment? In order to postpone, um, City Manager West had consulted with her staff uh, as to how the conditions might impact the actual execution of the resolution of that campsite. And they concluded that the rain and the mud would be an adverse circumstance for staff as well as people living in the tents. So um, I concurred with her decision to delay that until this spell of rain is over. Yeah, my next question was going to be how you felt about that because this is now the second time it's been postponed. Well, I, I, I think the public has to understand the decision has been made to clear the camps. The next decision point has to do with marshalling your human resources to get that job done because we use city staff as well as contractors to support us in uh, clearing out the encampment. Third, um, notice is helpful as well because there are community partners as well as our own social outreach workers that are still working the site to try to get people to voluntarily move to the um, Homeless Services Center. So it's a pretty significant undertaking. And then we look at the time of year we're at, where everybody wants to take time off. So um, recruiting enough staff and committing them to this project is no easy undertaking. And that's why she and I had conversations this morning as to whether or not we should delay it. And I know there'll be some in the abutting neighborhoods as well as businesses that are going to be disappointed that it appears we're kicking the can down the road, but we can continue our outreach work, but you got to have a safe environment to get the work done and the rain only aggravates the situation. When we look back to when it was postponed for the first time, um, that was more of a philosophical decision by the city to allow more time to do that this, um, yes, the city council um, passed uh, a majority resolution, which is an expression of opinion, that we, we should delay the uh, clearing of the encampment uh, on the idea that it would provide more time for community social service partners to make outreach to try to move people, as I said earlier, in a voluntary manner to the Homeless Services Center uh, to encourage them to make that right decision. So that was a recognition by the city manager and her team of that sentiment by the council. Uh, but at the same time, what's always lost in this conversation is the city manager and by extension her staff have a legal responsibility to enforce an existing ordinance. So historically, when we have not enforced a camping ordinance was predicated on the fact that we didn't have enough shelter beds. Today, or at least two days ago, we had 113 available beds. So there's no reason why somebody can't move themselves from an encampment to safe shelter conditions. So you didn't, you yourself and your power did not agree with that decision? Because you voted against it. I did. To I postpone it the first time. Um, I voted against the resolution um, I, because it does not direct the manager to do something specifically. We call that an order. That wasn't an order. I thought the resolution would only confuse the situation because of the fact that the city manager has a legal duty under the charter to enforce existing ordinances. Let's dive into the ordinance itself. Wasn't something that was heavily enforced in the past um, because it's hard because one bed here, one bed there, um, because the ordinance is that as long as there are, uh, there is space in the city run, in the city run shelters, that it is illegal to camp in the city. Yeah. It is, we do not choose to enforce the ordinance surrounding camping if there's no available bed resource, all right? That's a concession to the 
practical reality is you can't move them unless they have somewhere to go. Um, because the person in the encampment can choose to go to the shelter or choose to connect with others in their lives for, a, for an adequate space. You can go to your friends or family if that's the case. Or you could go to a bed with another community partner if you meet their admission criteria. But this all comes from a court case in the West Coast that says, listen, you can't enforce municipal ordinances for the act of sleeping somewhere. And therefore, many states, and in this instance, uh, Portland had a recognition of that legal environment. And that's why we would not enforce public camping unless we had the adequate beds. And part of the effort to create with a private entity um, a center for immigrants opened up the beds we need to meet the mission of the Homeless Services Center, which is to address uh, shelter first resources for people in encampments. So now, by enforcing this ordinance, now that you have a hundred some odd beds open at the HSC, um, this is your way of saying, Look, we're removing this encampment. We don't want anybody camping here. This is your chance to go to the shelter or leave. Or leave. I mean, the courts that have looked at this issue have said, look, municipalities have to make hard choices. We've invested $25 million in the effort to have a homeless services center. Uh, that's a significant burden on property taxpayers. Uh, those in encampments, we have done real work to try to lessen their perception or experience around barriers that prevents them from deciding to go into a shelter. But they need to make some hard choices too that maybe the environment we provide is not perfect to their understanding of what a shelter should be. But I think being warm, being inside, and having a safe bed is far superior than trying to survive a main winter in a vinyl tent. There are some people, I mean, in my experience reporting on this issue, um, that can't go to the HSC because of an ongoing drug addiction. Um, that might be an issue that prevents them from going to the shelter this next week when they get cleared. Well, we heard that early on, and working with Greater Portland Health Center, we are now uh, engaged in a medication assistant treatment initiative at the shelter. I, I recognize that someone trapped by substance use disorder fears on a very individual level being dope sick if they try to go cold turkey or they don't have access uh, to the substance they're abusing. But we now are prepared to receive individuals like that at the HSC and provide them medication to support that transition from drug abuse to some manner of sobriety. So we've heard that complaint. We've heard the complaint about the curfews too early. We've extended that. We've heard the complaint about I have a dog now and what's going to happen to him or her. We've addressed that with uh, a shelter for the animals. Uh, we've heard about my property hasn't been properly stored and um, we've addressed that. And I think staff working with other partners has done all they can do to make the door as wide open as possible for somebody to come in. And, and that's why we're in a position now to resolve the existence of camps uh, in the city. In my conversations with nonprofit profit providers like Preble Street, um, even if every single bed was filled in the city run shelters, there will still be tents in the city. So what's going to happen with those tents? We'll have to see when we get there. I mean, listen, um, because you're partners with someone doesn't mean you have 100% agreement on strategy. Uh, they, private agencies have a responsibility to their board of directors. We have a responsibility to the voters of Portland. We're trying to manage a municipality in all its legal and service responsibilities, their focus on serving a particular constituency. There's value in that partnership, but we have to make decisions 
that they might always not be in 100% agreement with. Today, we have the capacity to take the tents that we've counted and their occupants into shelter. Let's get that accomplished. Are we going to eradicate the condition of public camping forever? Probably not. But we can make a significant dent in its presence and the threat it poses to the people that live in the camps. Look, it's not safe or healthy to be in that condition. I'm not prepared as an individual counselor to watch people die from exposure or tent fires this winter. It's predictable, therefore it should be preventable. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're taking the steps we are today. I think friends or other support people in your life may be able to provide you refuge or safe harbor. Um, I think we're providing you safe harbor at the Homeless Services Center. If you elect to do other things, that's up to you. I mean, we're not, we can't compel you to go to the shelter. But we can say is we have a bed for you. It's available for you. You cannot camp here. Now the decision goes to you to make a decision. We, we're not coercing people. I, I see that sometimes in social media. We're going down there and coercing people into the show. No, we're not. We're just saying you have to make some choices as well. Down at the encampment today, um, just to put it frankly, some of the people I was talking to that help out homeless people were pissed off that they were given such short notice. Short notice of what? The postponement today. You know, I, I don't know what just to tell those people. We made a decision, I think the manager and I were on the phone at 6.30 this morning. Had we moved people in the rain, because we don't know if it was going to be pouring or a light sprinkle, but it appears we're going to have significant rain over the next three days. We would have been criticized for being inhumane to try to move them through rain, wind, and mud. And now we're holding back. I would think that they would see that as the opportunity to have three or four more days to convince people or help them make a decision to go to the shelter. Is there any internal debate happening between you and other counselors yes. and the additions at encampments and how to best deal with them, whether to keep them or push people <clears throat> out? I'm sure that there's counselors that disagree with you. Yes, there are counselors that disagree with me. You know, there, we have a division of opinion. That was the purpose of the sentiment, is they were trying to express their opinion. And, and I think the path is clear that they need to change the ordinance if they want to have the administration do something different. As I said earlier, the city manager and her team have to enforce the law. If they're not satisfied about the law and its consequences, then the council's free to take that up as a legislative proposal and change the law or seek through the work that I've commissioned to the uh, Committee on Health and Human Services to look at policy and practices and see how we can improve them. Those are long-term strategies. In the short term, this city has to ensure that the public health and safety of residents and the in-house are met. Have you walked through the encampments? Yeah, I've been down the encampments. When did you go? When did I go? It's been a couple weeks before I went down there. Last week I was out to Douglas Street uh, I stopped into uh, two new encampments or small gatherings and tents out in Deering. Um, yeah, I go down there. And down at Harvard View? Yeah, I've been down to Harvard View. Yeah. If we did it in the rain, we'd be criticized. If we wait for the rain to end, we're being criticized. Um, we have to do what's in everyone's best interest, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. With the approach of enforcing that existing ordinance, um, people may look at this as uncaring to homeless people. I think leaving them in existence is uncaring. Because what you're agreeing to is slow motion suicide. You know, that somehow somebody trapped by mental illness or significant substance use disorder is in the best possible place to make an informed decision as to their best interest. And that has been demonstrated by the number of deaths that we've had connected with being on a house is an issue. Look, that, that, a city can't say it cares about people if it allows those encampments to exist. I talked with one woman, she's 23 years old, 
we've reported on her in the past. Um, you may have seen her. Um, she had a little dog. You know, she told me that the city's out of touch and the city leadership counselors, you, don't know what it's like to be homeless. I think, do you, what do you think about that disconnect between how people who are living that situation view you? They're entitled to their opinion. You know, I mean, I was a police officer for a number of years. I ran a jail for over a decade. I was sympathetic, in some instances empathetic, to what people were going through. But my capacity to act in their best interests shouldn't be limited to this idea that I have no valid opinion or conclusion unless I have lived experience. I mean, that's, that in itself is a barrier. You can't help me unless you've been me, you know? I, I don't subscribe to that. The existence of tents in the city probably will not go away. But the encampments, your goal, may become spring. We won't see any camps. Uh, I think we're going to move forward. I mean, I look forward to the work of the Health and Human Services Committee to see whether or not we should consider other strategies. That's fine. But I think it's not in the best interest of a city in our community to just accept the fact that encampments are part of the new condition. You know, that we have neighborhoods and retail centers and encampments as an accepted fabric of what we call Portland. I think we need to do all we can as a city administration as well as working with community partners to say that that is not a condition, that we will address it when we confront it. I guess this remains to be seen, but would this look like if there's like a group of three tents on Commercial Street in like March, that city ordinance, would that be enforced? Yes, or? well, we'd have to look and see what we have for, re remember, the trigger right now is do we have an existing resource that's able to accept those individuals? If that is the case, then those, those individuals will be told you can't camp here. You know, you just can't. Is there any more look, work you're looking to do with the HSC when it comes to lowering barriers further? Is there anything that we could report that might be something you guys are looking at again? Well, it's early, I think. Um, Councilor Fournier is going to chair that effort. I mean, she's trying to put together a work plan now how to have what she's characterizing as a community summit to discuss these issues. And we'll see what strategies uh, come from that. I mean, I think one of the debates is there's some in the social service arena that feel like the timeline is dictated by the needs of the individual. Whereas I and others would say the timeline is dictated by public health and safety considerations and our need to intervene will probably come sooner than you would like. So that's a balance that has to be addressed. Because there was a lot of work by the city and by Preble Street and Milestone trickling people from Harborview into the shelters. There was, there was dozens of people who were going to the shelters yes. over the course of several months. Um, I guess I could pose this question to you. Why not just let that process go on? Because there is scientific evidence that says kicking people out of an encampment oh. can raise overdose chances. Listen, what? you know, scientific evidence. You know, as an attorney, we gather experts that can actually speak intelligently to both sides of a question. So this issue that one journal declared this is educational but it not necessarily dictate what policy should be. You know, when I was in the legislature, confronted with national studies, I would always ask the proponent of that information, but tell me about Maine. What's Maine's data? What is Maine experience? It's interesting to know what the national trend is, but those numbers are so big as to not be relevant. So the issues of the consequence of being removed from an encampment, I'd like to see local data. What's actually happened in Maine? You know, I mean, that's, it's not, it's not helpful to the conversation to try to inflame it that one group of experts has all the answers. Mm -hmm. uh, I've learned that oftentimes 
experts have real debates with each other as to what constitutes real information. Yeah, I know I totally agree. I think debating about things is a great way to come to a collective <sighs> understanding. Where I got that from was Preble Street. Yeah, of course. I, saying I, that, uh, you know, their phrasing of sweeping an encampment will raise overdose chances and people losing their stuff. It takes them a while to retrack where these people are in the uh, city. And if, if, the, if you are moving people from slowly from the encampment into the shelter, why not just let that process go instead of clearing Well, it? nowhere in that conversation is there any consideration of the neighbors who have to live with the existence of encampment. I mean, go to the police department. There's some data I could look at is reported crime uh, that's being experienced in those neighborhoods. Go down and talk to the businesses and see how they struggle with meeting their expectations with customers that are interrupted by what's going on in the encampments. Or let's talk to all the members of the encampment who needed medical intervention from police services and medical services. Listen, I mean, that's the data I have to look at. And those are the constituencies that need us to do our work. I said during the campaign, some of what we need to do will not be popular in certain quarters but it doesn't make it less right. And I don't want Portland, and I'll be clear about this, I do not want Portland to go down a spiral that so many cities out west have experienced because they didn't act quick enough. You know, it's destroyed cities, that's what I'm saying. Encampments should not be accepted as one more piece of our municipal fabric. Cities don't work under those conditions. So I think it's important for us to meet our responsibilities.